Hey, it's Violet. Before we dive into today's show, I've got a quick favor to ask. We have a survey up on our website, harpers.org slash survey. Would you please take it? It shouldn't take more than five minutes to complete. As we approach five years of the podcast, we have been discussing ways to make the show even better. That's why it's crucial we hear from you. The survey's up at harpers.org slash survey. Thank you in advance for lending your voice. Now, on to the show. Welcome to the Harper's Podcast. I'm your host, Violet Luca. In the June issue, Sierra Crane Murdoch writes about her experiences at Sacred Wisdom Circle Institute's Medicine Person Training Program which combines a variety of rituals derived from real indigenous practices. Others are entirely fake or are called Native American when they're actually from another continent. This group claims affiliation with the Native American church, even though Aklava, the group that Sacred Wisdom Circle received its certification from, has been harshly criticized by the church's leaders. The Native American Church was formed in 1918 by Native leaders from multiple tribes as an act of resistance to the banning of tribal ceremonies. It preserved traditions that were on the verge of being wiped out. However, the NAC doesn't restrict membership to Native people enrolled in or descended from recognized tribes. The United States' practice of defining Native American by blood quantum has always been problematic, to say the least, so it's unsurprising that leaders would eschew such definitions. But they also didn't foresee a future when pretending to be Native would be so fashionable or lucrative. Affiliation with the NAC not only grants an air of authenticity to any organization's proceedings, but in many jurisdictions, allows its members to legally possess peyote, a plant medicine that the church considers a sacrament. In the following conversation, Murdoch untangles this complicated web of belief, tradition, fetishization, and harm. But before we get into today's show, I want to tell you about another podcast that I think you'll really enjoy. It's called Critical Literary Consumption, and it's hosted by Anna Wynn, who interviews authors, poets, and scholars about their reading and practices. In each episode, Anna asks each guest questions that situate their written work in conversation with others and with current societal discourses. Her podcast can be found on Spotify or wherever podcasts can be downloaded, and I highly recommend you check it out. Okay, let's get on to our interview with Sierra Crane Murdoch. I really en- I enjoy this story a lot because it perhaps it it's it could seem like it's this very simple tale of appropriation. And there is appropriation in the story, but that's not the only thing that's going on here. So the piece begins you're in you're in the middle of medicine person training, which is a program offered by the Sacred Wisdom Circle Institute. And uh, it's a mother and her son, Linda Stone, and uh, her son, Jeff Gentle Eagle, also known as Gent. So could you talk about what attracted you to try this particular program and what, what was the sort of stuff that you underwent as part of your training? Yeah, you mentioned appropriation and how much, you know, this might enter into this story. And just to give a little behind the scenes. So I came to this story because I'm writing a book right now about what I've learned about whiteness and guilt over the course of the last decade I've spent reporting as a white woman on the margins of Native and non-Native communities. And so, you know, I've observed all these expressions of white guilt and probably expressed many of them myself. But one of the less obvious expressions I've become really interested in and I've spent a lot of time thinking and you know, writing and researching about is religious and spiritual appropriation, you know, like when a person might abandon whatever tradition they come from to pick up something that they feel is maybe more virtuous or like, you know, distant from the religion of an oppressor. So I was trying to figure out how I might explore that idea in a narrative way. And so when I got to this story, I I was thinking of this, you know, 
Facebook photograph that I had seen in 2016 of an acquaintance who was posing with a white man. Uh, they were both white posing in the um, in the Bay Area uh, where I was living at the time. And it caught my eye because there was this like ceremonial symbology in the photograph. And I thought, huh, they're like engaging in some sort of Native American ritual. Like I recognize the symbology mm. from stories I'd done in the past. Um, and as I dug into it, I learned that um, the man my acquaintance was posing with called himself a medicine man. And he was supposedly a leader of this branch of a Native American church that had been blessed, as he claimed on his website, by this group called Aklava. So I began to try to figure out what Aklava was. And this led me eventually to Linda Stone and Gent um, and uh, landed me in the middle of these mountains in Utah um, on this, uh, you know, ceremonial quest. And Aklava had been founded, I learned, in uh, the early 90s with the purpose of taking the medicine to the white man. And part of the purpose of Aklava was just sort of like spread you know, to, to spread across the country and across North America and across the world so that people would open up these branches of the group and would sort of run ceremonies themselves based on Native American traditions, but not actually totally resembling Native American traditions. And uh, in 2017, Linda Stone started this group called Sacred Wisdom Circle Institute that you mentioned, which was to train medicine people to basically open up their own branches of the Oklahoma Native American Church. And so I became really interested in this. <laughs> um, I wanted to understand, you know, what people were maybe getting out of this and what their motivations were. I wanted to understand appropriation in a deeper way. And of course, this story then led me into all these other directions that, I, that, um, that were, you know, less about appropriation and, and more about other, other themes. Yeah. One of your fellow uh, trainees is this guy who's referred to as Thad. He's a life coach who's reading a book about Carl Jung, and he's completing this medicine man training so he can incorporate psychedelics into his practice because Sacred Wisdom Circle and Oklahoma are technically part of the Native American church, and they have a dispensation from the U.S. government to use peyote and other psychedelics in their religious ceremonies. So it's interesting that he's reading a book about Carl Jung because Carl Jung would sort of, you know, at first he noticed patterns between um, hallucinations that schizophrenic patients experienced. Then he started looking at these similarities between different cultures and finding these archetypes, these images that repeat, these, these things that seem to be shared by humanity. And on, and on the one hand, that's really beautiful. And on the other hand, it has the potential to really flatten beliefs. And what, in your understanding, is the potential for harm when a ceremony, a ritual, or a system of beliefs is flattened, misunderstood, and shared with others for perhaps life coaching or what, whatever it might be? Yeah, this is a really challenging question. And it's, you know, the one I was trying to answer throughout the story, you know, what harm does this cause, right? Because you can have a lot of things that are appropriative, but those things might cause different levels of harm. And it's also, I found, really hard to describe harm done when that harm might be spiritual, you know, when it might not be material. And it's mm -hmm. really hard to especially describe that in a materialist society, right, where a lot of the ways we measure yes. harm are transactional. They're, they're you know, um, money lost. <laughs> they're, you know, wounds, mm -hmm. uh, you know, physical wounds um, accumulated. So I was not personally you know, deeply familiar with Carl Jung. Um, I, even though, you know, I know Carl Jung is especially right now having um, quite a, a moment <laughs> um, and mm -hmm. has for a long time, but I think especially among my generation um, has come to the fore in a bigger way right now. And I, one thing I did know about Carl Jung is that he had actually spent quite a bit of time in the Pueblos in uh, the Southwest. And a lot of his ideas around mysticism and the unconscious had actually come from the time he had spent with Native people, you know, asking them about their belief mm -hmm. systems. And, you know, 
Young in that way was really part of a lineage of writers, primarily non-Indigenous writers, who really since like the 60s have been writing about the ways that Indigenous modalities, Indigenous ways of thinking, Indigenous spiritualities can sort of be applied, you know, to our daily lives. And also the ways that those modalities maybe are very similar and have these parallels with a lot of other religions, uh, belief systems around the world. And, you know, one of the things I've been fascinated by in the course of reporting the story and working on my book is just the way that this lineage of white books that were primarily written by white authors peddled to white readers. And that really gave birth to this sort of more materialist understanding of um, Native spirituality, the way that they really collapsed boundaries, right? It, you know, <laughs> there was no distinction mm-hmm. between the ways different tribes, you know, um, thought about the world or their different uh, religious rites. The way that those books cast Native ways of spirituality was in the the synchronicities <laughs> with other cultures, and, um, mm-hmm. and so. Yeah, that's, that's something that's like very interesting. And it's had an enormous influence, like not only on non-native culture in America, but also actually on native culture. Like you see a lot of like pan-indigenous symbology. You see that symbology also coming from that lineage of the ways that we've sort of collapsed those um, those boundaries between uh, different belief systems. So it's interesting, and it's also confusing, <laughs> and um, and it's also mm-hmm potentially harmful, but it's really hard to measure that harm. It's really hard to say what that harm is. Um, in the case of this story, you know, that I wrote for Harper is it's, I want to go back to something you said when you asked this question. So just to clarify, this group claims affiliation with the Native American church, but the Native American church is actually a really essential religious institution that was founded in 1918. Yes. And it was founded largely as a resistance movement. Well, it had emerged already as a resistance movement in response to the reservation system. So as tribes were being forced onto reservations, forced to sign treaties, forced to give up vast tracts of land and live with much fewer resources that were only provided for them by the federal government, various uh, spiritual practices rose up in response to that as a way to sort of generate community, to generate a sense of um, connectedness and to create a space for healing from those traumas that were being experienced right at that moment. And the Native American church was highly successful in that regard. So in 1918, um, it was established formally in Oklahoma and it expanded and spread across the country to include hundreds of chapters, hundreds of thousands of members, of Native members across the country. And its religion was peyote religion, it is peyote religion. And that Mm. is based on a ceremony that was developed like early on in this movement. Um, And that's relatively, you know, there are some variations, but that it's relatively consistent across all the groups that practice it across, um, across North America. And it, and it's a really important movement that has continued to be a sanctuary for native people to gather, to practice and to really engage in active healing um, from the things that they've experienced. Even the word shaman is an erasure because shaman, they're different all over the world. They're different shamanistic mm-hmm. traditions. But the word shaman comes from this like a group of indigenous people who are like in Russia near Mongolia, the Manchu mm-hmm. Tungus. And that's so anytime you say shaman instead of like the Ute right. word for shaman. There's an act of erasure happening, right? So and there, there's this collapsing that's going on. But it, it's like, obviously, we language, we have to communicate certain mm-hmm. ideas. But sometimes what exactly is being lost or these confusions can perpetuate other confusions, which can perpetuate something like uh, a book that was written by a white person in the 1970s being considered a holy right. text and other 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 practices being derived right. from it. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I spoke about there being different levels, right, of, of harm done by different kinds of appropriation. Mm-hmm. And here in the Native American church, it's very clear what's, you know, what 
can what can be harmful. For, so, for example, most importantly, peyote is extremely rare. It's um, it, it grows yeah. only in a part only like down near Texas. And there is actually a group that has uh, come together in recent years to try to preserve peyote land so that Native people can have more reliable access to that and that it won't disappear as a sort of native plant in the future. So that's one thing, right? And that's actually a more material <laughs> like uh, harm, right? You can actually measure <laughs> that, right? This is something that is rare. But yeah, what is the harm done when those um, ceremonies are taken and maybe changed? One of the things that I, you know, I interviewed a lot of native religious leaders and also um you know, people I knew myself who who are engaged in, you know, scholars who are thinking about the line between uh, harm and, and not harm and appropriation. And <laughs> and also, like, what makes these ceremonies powerful? Like, what actually holds the power for, for um, the communities that are practicing them? And, um, you know, one of the things I heard a lot was just that these, you know, these ceremonies are happening within... A, a cultural framework, right? Yeah. Ceremonies are of the land, right? A lot of the ceremonies that originated among tribes across the United States are connected to a particular place, you know? They're connected to a particular family, maybe. Um, and so there's a specificity to them, right, that that isn't captured when you then um, sort of zoom out and say, like, oh, I'm really into Native American religion, you know? It's like, okay, well, what religion <laughs> which, which try which try yeah, yeah. What, there um, is no <laughs> yeah um but yeah it's it, it's really it's really complicated <laughs> yeah i mean and you know one of the first participants you quote in the piece says he loved the authenticity of what he was being asked to do and Let's look at our cultural framework. Let's work at, look at white people cultural framework, right? White American cultural framework. There's this desire or a fetishization of authenticity that animates, you know, the these white people who come to these ceremonies. And where do you feel like that urge comes from? Because, you know, they're already living an authentic white American experience. So what sort of authenticity are they seeking? Why are they seeking that? Yeah, <laughs> there was so much desire for authenticity. And to be honest, like, this was a really hard story for me, because it's a story about belief systems. And a lot of these people were sort of drifting among belief systems, right, searching for something that felt right to them, mm -hmm. that felt authentic, with not a lot of guidance from the social structures that you know, in a tribe, for example, might typically help someone find a spiritual method, right? So they didn't have a strong community yeah. around them who could show them an inherited practice, or they didn't have elders whom they could learn from. And so, you know, I, I really felt like I was among spiritual orphans. And that's a very uncomfortable place to be among like so much searching, so much grasping, like so much not knowing one's own identity. And pain, and pain, yeah. And, you know, I, I do think it's it's easy to dismiss their spiritual explorations as, like, materialist fads. But one of the things that surprised me, and, and probably should not have surprised me, was that many of these participants were searching for real healing. And this was what made the story so difficult, right? That they, they really were searching for something authentic. But by authenticity, right, you know, I, I don't think they meant, like, we're searching for something, like, real, something that's, like really traditional, right? It's something that they sort of saw from the outside right. as like authentically native or authentically Lakota or whatever. But something something that felt like truly connective, right? Something where they felt like a place of safety and a and a sense of home, like a sense of having a spiritual home. And so I do, you know, I do believe a lot of these participants were were genuinely searching from for that. And still that sort of sense of being among people who felt so lost in that way was really uncomfortable and it was really hard to to sort out you know I, I could both what felt authentic to me was the moments when they opened up and talked about their life stories and things that they've gone through and the real things that they're trying to heal from and what that felt inauthentic to me was I think you know the the way that these <laughs> ceremonies we were participating in um, were gleaned, but sort of like reinterpreted, but also not entirely based in the traditions um, that I knew they were drawing from, and that I had actually spent time in myself before even going to Utah. 
So what was it like for you to witness these practices, you know, that are rooted in history and tradition? Because you, you describe being at actual Sundance. Did you ever have an interest in participating in these practices when they were practiced by the actual people who yeah. created them and have protected them through incredible historical hardships? Or did you find yourself imagining how participating might affect your own life? Yeah. And, you know, it's important to acknowledge, right, that there's not a monolithic opinion among the Native people I've spoken to about the degree to which non-Native people could or should participate in any, you know, in, in any sort of like Native ceremony. I've encountered a range of feelings and opinions and a lot of um, the holy men I know have decided for themselves, like what feels comfortable for them. And for my part, you know, I never sought this out personally. It was, you know, I, I never was like, I really, you know, I really want to go into a sweat lodge. <laughs> like, I really want to go to a Sundance. <laughs> um, I started being invited sometimes to ceremonies because I was spending time in communities and writing intimately about certain people's lives. And they would say, okay, to understand this, like, why don't you come to Sweat Lodge with me? Or why don't you come to Sundance with me? And so I started being invited to these ceremonies um, and mainly actually through the book that I wrote, the first book I wrote, Yellow Bird, um, which was about this woman, Lissa Yellowbird, we spoke about on the podcast last time. And she she had come out of prison. She was coming out of addiction. And um, these ceremonies were really important to her for healing and to for um, remaining sober and for finding a direction in her life. Um, mm-hmm. And that is the case with a lot of the spiritual communities I've encountered in my work in the time that I've been working. And they honestly were meaningful to me. You know, I, um, I never went in there feeling like this is something I'm going to take on. <laughs> this is something like that is going yeah. to become my religion or my spiritual modality. But it's, it's really powerful to like be in a sweat lodge and to be prayed for. Like I didn't grow up religious at all. You know, I, I wouldn't say my family's mm-hmm. atheist, but I we definitely were not religious. And I think being among a community of people and praying for them and being prayed for was very powerful. And I witnessed the healing that can come from that level of community, that level of spiritual engagement. And so I don't at all want to dismiss that. And I, and I think that probably a lot of people who I encountered in the reporting of this story really, you know, were searching for that. <laughs> um, we're really genuinely yeah. wanting that. And yeah, I, I wanted to acknowledge that in this piece that beneath all these layers of appropriation and discomfort and disrespect, you know, there is there is a real wanting. And, you know, that that idea of respect, too, is is really important. You know, like I asked uh, Lissa's uncle, actually, who's a decolonization scholar and a um, someone who writes a lot about mindfulness and the way that mindfulness might actually undo trauma in indigenous brains. They didn't put this in the piece, but, you know, I said, is there any way for non-Native people to respectfully engage in in any sort of Native spirituality? And he was like, oh, yeah, of course. You know, like tribes have a long history <laughs> of adopting members into their tribe. Right. But, you know, to participate at that level requires a great deal of work. Right. It requires like being part of a community. It requires upholding indigenous sovereignty. It requires maybe learning the language. It requires, you know, tending to the well-being of, of the people who are bringing you into that family. So yeah, I, you know, I, I thought a lot about, okay, like what, what is the edge of respect here? What is respectful? What is not? In this story, I write about TJ Plenty Chief, who is a roadman in the Native American church and also a Sundance leader on MHA Nation in North Dakota. He was taught by his uncles how to be a roadman. He was taught all of these traditions and learned them, you know, over the course of his life and eventually, you know, was blessed to run his own peyote ceremonies. And in that process, you know, his uncles also warned him about non-Native people coming and soliciting access to those ceremonies. And he said, you know, there was this worry that we might lose um, what we have left. At the same time, and this is something that 
we'll go in the long version of the story. But at the same time, you know, TJ also, he actually invites non, some non-Native people to his Sundances, right? He told me, you know, I would never, he's like, you could come to a peyote ceremony, but I would never let you take the peyote. You know, that is like the flesh of our God. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and if you're not yeah. sort of subscribing to that religion, like I just, I, I don't think that's a good idea. Um, but there are a lot of non-Native people who do participate in, um, in ceremonies, but who do so as part of the community, right? Who, right devote themselves year after year to setting up the ceremonial grounds and keeping the fire and, you know, uh, and participating on a real communal level with an act of reciprocity, giving back, um, giving back to those communities. Yeah, I think that question of reciprocity is crucial because the people who are participating in this dubious, I guess we can call it dubious, uh, you know, training, you know, it doesn't mean that they don't deserve to be healed. Because you write in the piece, you don't doubt the cathartic potential of rituals in plant medicine. And, you know, just like Jung, just like psychoanalysis, just like socialism, <laughs> uh, this interest in psychedelics is coming back, and particularly research for treating trauma, PTSD, other even depression. So to play devil's advocate for a second, you know, let's set aside any sort of question of whether it is or is not okay for scientists to research psychedelics for treatment purposes. To play devil's advocate, what about the placebo effect? What about the the fact that if you believe hard enough in something, it can potentially heal you? And I mean, the people who participated in the medicine person training you underwent, they might be healed. You know, they're, they're, they had legitimate pain and they might be healed because they believed in it enough. And it doesn't matter that it's appropriative or inauthentic. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I actually... I do believe there are, well, I mean, I, I don't think that you can be healed by like one particular um, experience. You know, I think it's like, <laughs> no, there's not a button. That right. Button. <laughs> that would be, that it's would not be a video truly, game. Uh, amazing. But um, no, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think people can probably get genuine healing. And, I, and you know, in my conversations and experiences um, with some of the participants, I think some of them did have some genuinely meaningful experiences. I think we have to hold these two ideas at one time, right? That something that could be beneficial to ourselves, <laughs> something that could genuinely benefit ourselves, could actually create harm for someone else. And I think it's really hard to sort of hold mm. those two ideas at the same time, right? Because we want to believe that something that's like really beautiful for us <laughs> is also beautiful for someone else, right? That we're just... Well- also, we're materialist culture, right. as you said it. So it's like, well, I have something other someone else right. doesn't have something, <laughs> <laughs> like, right? Like it's like one. There's only limited resources, and their resources are finite. Right. And therefore, right. And you know, I, it was. I, I talked about how hard this story was, right, and how uncomfortable I felt a lot through it. And maybe it's ironic that I kept having to ask myself, you know, like, what is my purpose here? <laughs> you know? um, and of course, my purpose <laughs> as a journalist is to just go and see, you know, but like, why? <laughs> you know, and, and do I have to make a judgment? <laughs> um, and to your question, I kept going back to, you know, what I think is perhaps the underlying reason I became a journalist, which is the desire to contribute to a world in which, you know, fewer people suffer and more people thrive. And I, I do believe that plant medicines or psychedelics or whatever we choose to call them have the potential to relieve a lot of suffering. And, and we're learning more and more about that. And that's good. Um, but I also believe we should be mindful of the ways in which power in, and money in the past you know, and now um, have decided who has access to these methods of relieving a person's suffering. And so, you know, when people like TJ Plenty Chief and also this man, Sander Iron Rope, who started the Conserva- Peyote Conservation Initiative, you know, when they told me, we're glad you're doing this story, but please leave peyote alone, you know, I, I listened because mm-hmm. I think history is important and the history of who has access to these medicines and who has fought for these medicines is really important. Yeah. And because you had been asked not to partake in peyote, 
was that what led you to the choice not to participate in this ritual, even though you as a journalist could have done this in the name of participating and seeing, perhaps observing what happened to you as a result of it? Yeah, um, I I mean, I will say I in some ways I did participate, right? Like I I was there for the rituals, you know, and I, I just didn't ingest peyote. And yeah, it was it was, you know, what I learned from my conversations with roadmen in the Native American church that encouraged me to not take peyote. I didn't tell people there that I wasn't taking it. Um, I just sort of made that choice for myself. I did ask Gent, you know, who was helping run this program before I went. And and I m- want to be clear, I was like on the phone with <laughs> this group, you know, once or twice a week for six months prior to even going to Utah and participating in these ceremonies. I, I did ask him, you know, is it possible to participate in these or to sort of, you know, gain <laughs> uh, healing from them, you know, without actually consuming peyote? And he said, yeah, I think it is, you know, so uh, I don't know if that's necessarily the placebo effect or just the fact that sometimes in a community setting, you can feel a lot of power from, again, people praying together. But I was skeptical of even sort of gaining that much uh, meaning personally from from going to these ceremonies when I felt like, you know, the people participating weren't really asking questions about, you know, where these ceremonies came from or what they were participating in or even what Aquila was, like where it came from. Yeah. I think everyone is familiar with, you know, the phenomenon of white people claiming indigenous Mm -hmm. heritage. You know, uh, the practitioners here claim to have Native American backgrounds. They do not. And this is extremely common you know it's hard not to think about um, elizabeth warren you know uh but what is it about white americans that leads us to invent or appropriate this ancestry do do you think it has to do with our own kind of superficial relationship with history or is it just i i want to be special (laughs) it's it's very strange it keeps it happens all the time yeah i don't know (laughs) Um, and I, you know, I, I think it's important to it. This is a really big and sort of hot button issue at the moment. I want to acknowledge that, yes, this happens, like non-Native people <laughs> pretend that they're Native and maybe even convince themselves that they are. Claiming identity is really complicated and I'm not Native. I'm not an expert in it. Um, so I, you know, as much as possible, defer to other Native people and scholars on that topic. But I, you know, I do want to say like blood quantum is a very problematic system that was invented by the yes. government to define Native Americans by race. And there are a lot of young Native people who I know personally, like I was just teaching in Montana and had several students in this situation, you know, who grew up in Native families, who are culturally part of tribal nations, who don't have the right fraction of blood to qualify as federally recognized members of their tribe. And there are also a lot of Native people who have been separated from their lineages, you know, by foster care, by adoption, by termination of tribal status through the last century. Like, it has been the federal policy to erase, like, Native identity. Um, So that's why identity is so complicated. And there has been um, a trend in trying to, like, call out a lot of people who some people claim are not native and um, they've gotten it wrong. And so I just want to be like careful that, you know, it's, it's really complicated and I'm um, yeah, I don't feel (laughs) um, qualified to be an arbiter of that. Um, But yeah, (laughs) Uh, I just feel like I have to make that clear, but, um, but yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, this is, this goes back to sort of something I mentioned in the beginning, right? I became interested, you know, maybe not just on sort of a racial identity scale, but just on a sort of spiritual scale, like why, or just noticing this pattern of people abandoning whatever tradition they came from in favor of something that felt more virtuous, like more connected to the earth, more, Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, less like involved (laughs) with 
um, someone they considered oppressive or, or a system they considered oppressive. And again, like that instinct might be genuine, you know, like there are a lot of reasons people leave their denominations. Um, they might have felt betrayed mm. in some way. And actually, you know, a lot of the people I met in Utah were ex-Mormons. And I thought that was just yes, a really I... interesting thing, right? Not only because of uh, the fact that, you know, this was a religion that they felt abandoned by or betrayed by, and so they were looking for something new, but also just, I think, the translation of like Mormon belief systems and, or Mormon sort of ways of thinking into like a new modality. One of the most incredible quotes uh, from this piece is when Gent, again, which is short for gentle eagle, but he chooses to go by Gent. He seems like a really fascinating person. And he did one of these uh, swab tests and he knows that he's not of indigenous descent, but he says, quote, I wasn't seeking to appropriate anything, but this is what I grew up with, and it's what I love, so it's what I do. Which is such a twist, which is such a uh, very, um, it shows the complexity of belief and of what is going on here. I mean, what was it, what other sort of interactions did you have with Gent that sort of led you to feel that, you know, to recognize this complexity or just... What was it like hanging out with him? Because he, he seems skeptical, but also into it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Jen is very complex. Um, and I, I caught him at a moment in his life that I think he was really where he in which he was really wrestling um, with questions himself. And he was maybe one of the few people from the beginning, because, you know, when I when I said I, I want to take this I want to do this program and I'm a writer and I've spent a lot of time going to ceremonies in Native communities and I'm curious you know what draws white people to these things <laughs> um, and I, mm -hmm. I want to learn more about that and you know I was open and he was like yeah okay sure but you know he also was I think the most aware of the potential harms done or at least aware of like the conversations around appropriation spiritual appropriation and i think he was able to see i think those layers of appropriation within aklava in a way that maybe his mother and certainly not james mooney himself see that was that you know aklava as I, we talked about earlier claims affiliation with the native american church but it was founded in the early 90s by James Mooney and was not condoned by other leaders of the Native American church. And in fact, other leaders of the Native American church have actively spoken out against Oklava and denounced them for appropriating a religion that, you know, Native people have fought for, Native people have gone to jail for, and also one that is still essential in these communities for their healing. And so Oklava is is very much not accepted among um, most of the Native people that I interviewed for this story. And Jen, you know, meanwhile, knows that Aklava is create, generating these cards, like these, there are these membership cards that you can pay $250 for. And yes. these cards supposedly authorize you to carry Native American, quote, Native American sacraments. And they define Native American sacraments broadly as like, you know, cannabis, um, not just peyote, but also San Pedro, ayahuasca, combo, you know, all of these um, plant medicines and other substances that are used in, that have been traditionally used as entheogens, so psychedelics that have um, spiritual applications. But <laughs> this is, this is not actually, there's no law that protects you for holding those those medicines just by being a member of the Native American church. The Native American church has been very explicit that its only sacrament is peyote. And in fact, mm -hmm. the Native American church was successful in getting peyote to be the only schedule one substance in federal law that is permitted for religious use for members of the Native American church. And this is where it gets legally or sort of, yeah, syntactically complicated because the Native American church doesn't necessarily have a policy as to who can be among its membership. 
And that goes back to the blood quantum issue, right? Like they don't want to define who can be a member based on blood quantum um, because blood quantum is really messed up. So they um, so they say, you know, Native American church. And then later on in the lineage of this legislation that um, first got integrated into federal law in 1965, um, later on, there was a law passed in 1994 that clarified that language and said to be an Indian, a bona fide Indian, you have to be a member of a federally recognized tribe. And again, that doesn't address the complexity of the fact that there are tribes that have been terminated. There are young people who can't become members of their tribes anymore. But it was a little bit clarifying. But yeah, but basically, you know, like (laughs) Aklava sells these cards and they also allow groups to open up their own branches and pay like $2,500 to open up their own branch and hold, you know, medicine ceremonies for their their own members. One of, you know, one of the biggest ayahuasca churches in New York City is an Aklava branch. It was written Mm -hmm. about in the New Yorker, but Aklava wasn't mentioned, you know, years ago. So these places are everywhere. Like just the other, you know, a couple months ago, a friend of mine mentioned that he was at dinner and someone like whipped out one of these cards. <laughs> so, it, but Check yeah, so just like, but getting back to Gent, like he, he told me like, this is highly misleading and yeah, these cards don't really count for anything, but he's still participating in this. And he, you know, he and James Mooney have a highly complex relationship and have largely had a falling out. But yeah, it's, it's very complicated. I'm always kind of suspicious of when New York Times is like, okay, it's Thanksgiving. It's time to talk to your racist uncle. How do you talk to your <laughs> racist uncle? And it's, it's very, it's very, I think it's very patronizing and I don't, to the racist uncle <laughs> and to the reader. But um, what would you say to, you know, say somebody is at a party and someone does pull out the card that's signed by James Moody? You know, how do you react or sort of approach this person with compassion and maybe some skepticism? Or is that something that you shouldn't, you should, you don't do that at a party? Oh, at a party? Oh, I don't have very many social graces. So. Or, even, or I guess sort of any, I guess, I guess sort of like any, I guess this, any sort of like you're getting to know somebody and they mention yeah, this about yeah. themselves that, oh, yes, I'm, I'm, you know, and they're really into it and you want to be respectful to them but also you disagree perhaps disagree with with the, with the sort of uh the, yeah the you know the appropriation yeah i mean i, I well this. my my instinct would just be to ask a lot of questions because i'm just endlessly curious about <laughs> like <laughs> how people's motivations um but i am endlessly curious and yet i'm constantly shocked by the lack of curiosity right of like it, it just surprised me honestly that people weren't asking these questions that people weren't wondering how legitimate is this card and who is the person who created it and why am I paying money to them and like do other Mm -hmm. like native spiritual communities collect money like collect payments for their ceremonies like absolutely not you know that's actually taboo you know people give donations for like the roadman's gas you know or like gifts um but yeah I you know I, I think I would just I don't know what I do. I, you know, I run into this so much. There's so little understanding of of the way contemporary Indigenous people in the United States live and operate, and and um, it's just not taught in schools. You know, it's it's like a part of society that most non-Native people really have almost no understanding or interaction with, and so maybe they just don't even know the questions to begin to ask. But I think I would just want to share that history. Like, I think the history says a lot, right? The history of the Native American church, like fighting for its ability to hold these ceremonies. And these ceremonies have not just survived, like they have risen in response. Like they are resistance movements to colonization. And so, Mm -hmm. yeah, helping people understand that. But, you know, in the fact-checking process for this story, you know, I I had to call everyone who um, was in the story and we had these conversations and I you know many of them I said I expressed my complicated feelings about aspects of this story and my concerns about appropriation and 
people have very different responses. You know, I think a lot of people are, are, are really firm in their own personal beliefs and it can be really difficult um, to uh, shift those even, even with more information. Um, so I, I don't know, <laughs> I guess it depends on how much energy I have that day, <laughs> but, <laughs> but probably what I would do would just, just be to ask more questions of them. Right. I mean, do you, could there ever be a respectful way to have, you know, for somebody to establish a church or some sort of tradition that is using plant medicine and doesn't involve Native Americans? Is there, is there, is that possible? Or is that, again, too complicated to say? Even without, let's say, like, let's take the appropriation out. Let's say they're just doing their own thing. Is that still... Well, it, it depends, right? Is no. it peyote? Like, peyote is still endangered. You know, should we be growing peyote in greenhouses? I don't know. Sander Iron Rope, who founded that um, peyote, con- or helped found the Indigenous Peyote Conservation Initiative, you know, he says that, like, you know, peyote is of the land and Indigenous people are of the land. And, like, when you have that history, you, you can't, like, separate the biology from the culture of the plant. And so... Um, he mm-hmm. feels, you know, like growing peyote in greenhouses is actually stripping the plant of that culture. I think, you know, maybe other people feel differently about growing peyote in greenhouses for non-native people. I don't, I don't really know. But yeah, I, you know, I, I do believe in the power of ceremony, and I do believe in the power of plant medicines. And uh, you know, I think there must be a way for those um, to be practiced respectfully and in a way in a manner that's not appropriative or in a manner that's like honoring of where they come from and you know a a big element of this is money right like um like is yeah uh, you know very often where something crosses over from not harmful to harmful is sometimes in the collection of money right is someone running a business Mm -hmm. out of someone else's spirituality um that's harmful right (laughs) like And this might not just be like non-native practitioners. It could also be native practitioners. You know, there was a history of, (laughs) um, you know, there was a complicated history in that lineage of, you know, books being published about Native American modes of spirituality. Um, You know, you had Carlos Castaneda, right, who was writing about, Mm -hmm. um, who like fabricated uh, this a uh, man who we went to meet in Mexico who taught him about the ways of peyote, right? And um, and then after that, you had this like profusion of what critics would call them plastic medicine men. Um, you had a man named Sunbear mm-hmm. who was accused of this. Um, Sunbear was Anishinaabe. And so, you know, you had this like history of people like charging ceremonies, sort of molding ceremonies to the fantasies of white spiritual seekers. And that can be really harmful because yeah. you know then you're creating an expectation among non-native people of what these ceremonies might be right and you're also uh, you're making them transactional and mm-hmm. uh you know uh, you know a lot of people i've spoken with have said you know well that like that removes move, removes the spiritual power from it um and also it's it's not investing in sort of the healing of their own communities so that's really complicated on its own too <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, and again, I think it's really important to underline that Native Americans can get in on the grift. Like, like you know, again, it's it, it, there as long as that desire for money is there, anybody can become a bad actor. And that's where it, it I think you're totally right. That's where it tends to, it goes really wrong. It goes to a bad place. Yeah, or, yeah. And, but, but just like, it, but within the context of like, non-native people so wanting that right like so wanting that that they create yes. the opportunity for it right that is yeah meeting the meeting right, the market that that desire, desire <laughs> on our part could be the thing that is creating like that corruption of a really valuable tradition you've been listening to the harper's podcast the music is cut and shoot by febrifuge The New York Times called Harper's America's Most Interesting Magazine. Receive elegant, insightful, and wry writing from the best journalists, essayists, critics, novelists, and poets every month in our print magazine 
and gain access to our digital archive, which stretches back to 1850. Visit harpers.org save to subscribe for only 1697.